so that I won't be grim. I, I like to begin with a little humor that way. No matter what else, there'll be a little humor at the beginning. Lucy from the old comic strip Peanuts is talking with a little boy. And she says, five? Your name is five? What sort of a name is that? And the fellow says, the boy says, my dad is disturbed by all the numbers being put on us these days. So he changed our names to numbers. And Lucy says, is this way, this is his way of protesting, huh? And the boy says, no, this is his way of giving in, <laughs> letting everybody be a number. I guess if you named a child five, some would say you were making a joke out of the idea of everything having a number. It seems like everything does have a number these days. In a science fiction story I read once, the main character was named Ralph 124C41. <laughs> one to her C for one, so he could see the future. <laughs> they made a mistake and get, you know, because that way he could see the future. <clears throat> yeah. Sometimes the names of children in the Bible do have special significance. In Genesis 33, 32, 28, let's read that. The angel said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. He struggles with God because you have struggled with God and with men and you have won. In Matthew 1, 21, you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. In English, uh, in America, you, you don't usually name your child Jesus, but in the Latin language, it's an honor to call your child Jesus. You know, same name, uh, different customs, but names do have significance. Down in the bottom right, is the verse that I scribbled on the board. I gave up trying to make it neat, but it's printed here. Let's read Acts 11, 26. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught many people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So the name, the very name Christian has a, a symbolic meaning to Christians that the world doesn't understand. We want to be like Christ. We want to be Christ's disciples. The world just thinks it's the name of some religious group or something. They don't know. We're going to talk this morning about Hosea's children. We've already introduced the idea of Symbolic names, names that mean things beyond their just designation as a name. Hosea was a prophet of God. I always, when I taught, I always taught the kids, you don't want to be a prophet of God like they had in the Old Testament. They, most of them, led lives that you wouldn't want to have to lead. And Hosea is one of the examples. God had him marry a prostitute to symbolize Israel's religious idolatry. He was a prophet during the 8th century before Christ in the time of, well, we're going to read about the time here. So, Let's read the first three verses of Hosea 1 together. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, 
and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to you a wife of prostitutions and children of prostitutions, for the land has committed great prostitution, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, which conceived and bore him a son. And that's what he had to do as a prophet. And the names of his children were symbolic names. The first one is of Hosea's children, A there, A1. Their first son was named Jezreel, which meant he sows as he sows crops or he sows seed, you know, not he sows with a thread and needle. Hosea chapter 1 verse 4, let's read that. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and will cause the kingdom of the house of Israel to cease. Jezreel itself was a valley where Israel sowed grain and they also sowed idolatry. It was a very fertile place and a lot of the northernmost area relied on the valley of Jezreel for their like wheat belt or their agricultural zone. And since it had so much crops and growth there, that's also where they chose to worship the foreign idols and committed their spiritual prostitution. So God was going to sow vengeance for their idolatry. He says, yet a little while and I will avenge. Page 2. Hosea had three children by this woman. A2, their second child, was a daughter, Lo Ruhamah, which meant God would show no mercy. Now, before we read the scripture, we can think about lots of times when God was judging people and then he showed mercy. At Mount Sinai, when the people worshipped idols while Moses was in the mountain, he judged the people. He was going to kill them all, and Moses prayed, and he said, okay, I won't kill them all. He killed thousands of them, but then he stopped, and he showed mercy on the rest of them. But this time, he said, no mercy. Hosea 1.6, let's read that. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. And God said to him, Call her name Lo-Ruhamah, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. No more mercy. If we pause again for a second, it's not written down here. When the Old Testament prophets began to prophesy, they told the people, you're doing wrong. God wants you to repent and then everything will be all right. And they didn't much repent. And as the number of prophets went on, the message became stronger. You've got to repent or God is going to punish you drastically. And then it said, one of them said, you've got to repent because God is going to punish you drastically. But if you'd repent, he'd change his mind. And here, God has said, you people have reached the point of no return. 
You've pushed me, the living God, where I can't be pushed. Now the fulfillment of that prophecy where God was going to destroy them and take them away was fulfilled by Sennacherib. In the middle of the page, 2 Kings 17, 22 and 23, let's read that. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land in Assyria to this day. So Sennacherib came from Assyria and defeated the people in battle because the Lord wasn't with them. He burned their cities one by one. A3, the third child, was a son named Lo-Ami, which meant not my people. Can you imagine that terrible judgment? God saying, you are not my people. Hosea 1, verses 8 and 9. Let's read that. Now when she had weaned lo Ruhama and bore a son, then said God, call his name Lo-Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Isn't that a solemn thought to realize that people can push it so far that God will say, I will not be your God. Those were the three children. Jezreel, God is going to sow vengeance on them for their spiritual idolatry. Lo Ruama, God is not going to show uh, any mercy. And Lo Ami, they're not going to be my people anymore. And you never in the Bible ever read about God bringing Israel back, not the tw ten tribes of the north, from this point, they're gone. I think it's funny that some of the, some of the crazy religions people start up today claim that they descend from the lost tribes of Israel. And they don't even realize they're saying, we descend from people that God said, I'm turning my back on you, I'm judging you with pouring out vengeance, I'm sending you away, and you will never be my people, and I will never be your God. That's hardly what you want as a background <laughs> to claim, that's why I'm authorized to have this religion. What a sad thing. But that's what people get into when they, as is popular today, invent their own prophets and invent their own religions. Now, the second main point here, you don't see it in the English. But he has said, I will have no mercy on them the name of the daughter, Lo Ruhama. I will have no mercy on them. Then he says, but on the house of Judah, I will have mercy. And if you see it in the original language or the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you, you see that the, the girl was called, I will not have mercy. 
but on the house of Judah, I will have mercy. Go to the top of page three now, and we'll read the scripture that says that. Hosea chapter four, verse seven. But I will have mercy, or Ruhama, on the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, not by horsemen. So this was fulfilled by God on Sennacherib. God used Sennacherib, the Assyrian, to take the northern tribes captive and, and distribute them into Assyrian captivity away from his presence. And eventually Sennacherib came down. You can read about it. It's several chapters long. But he came down with this massive army and camped outside of Jerusalem. And he had a speaker with a big voice stand up there and proclaim, what puny God do you folks think is going to protect you? Is it the same God that was supposed to protect all those cities up in the north? I've got news for you. I burned them. Me and my army, we went up there. We wiped them out. We took them all captive. And that's what's going to happen to you. But Hezekiah did something that the people in the north didn't do. <laughs> Hezekiah prayed. Just poured it out to God. And the second intelligent thing he did, he went to the prophet of God. And the prophet of God told him, don't worry about it. I, God, am going to take these people like a horse and I'm going to stick my hook in his nose. And I'm going to jerk him around and put a bridle on him. And I'm going to ride him like a horse and send him home. That's one of the figures he used for it. In, well, I, I think it's 2 Kings. I'm sorry, it didn't print. 2 Kings 19, 35 through 36, we can read what happened to him. Let's read that together. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelled at Nineveh. And God had prophesied through Hosea, I won't save them by a bow. I won't save them by a sword. I won't save them by battle or horses or horsemen. He just sent one angel out. Take care of it. One angel. There's a scripture that says that when the people of Israel were ready to leave Egypt and, and the night of the Passover, that God sent one angel, one angel. And this angel of death came through and killed Every first son of everybody in all of Egypt and the firstborn male animal of every animal in Egypt in a single night. And the next morning, the 
all of Egypt was full of the sound of the grief and the mourning. God didn't need bows and arrows. God didn't need armies. God didn't need all the things Sennacherib had. He just wiped the army out. When I read that passage, I've always wondered who it was that woke up in the morning. <laughs> he killed 185,000 and they were all dead corpses. Somebody got up in the morning <laughs> to find them. And somebody told Sennacherib. And there wasn't much left he could do, was there? What is this wonderful king that, killed, that, that destroyed all of the Israelites north of there, not knowing it was the will of God that he was supposed to do it? And he comes down there and he wakes up and overnight every last person in his army is dead. And animals. Do what? And firstborn of animals. Oh no, that was in Egypt at the Passover. Yeah. The same thing with in the when the reason the people, the children of Israel were able to leave on the Exodus is because Pharaoh called Moses and said, just get out of my sight, take anything you want, and just get out of here. I never want to see you again. He changed his mind, but he still told him to get out. When God decides to wipe out the opposition, he does it like no man could possibly do it. There's one more prophecy in this first chapter of Hosea. C on the middle of page three. We're going from Lo Ami, which meant not my people, to the sons of the living God. Hosea 1 verse 10. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. People are so silly, again, for reasons totally unknown to me, some of the so-called commentators who like to talk more than they like to read or think or read the Bible, claimed all kinds of nonsense about this. But God explains himself. The prophecy is said to be fulfilled in the New Testament, in Christ. What he did is he took the people of Israel he said, you are not my people, and he drove them out into the nations. He treated them as Gentiles, the people alien to the Jews. And under Christ, chapter 9 of Romans talks about the coming of the aliens or the not not people from Mars, but the non-Jewish Gentiles being brought into the church by the blood of Christ and becoming sons of the living God. The very expression, and it says, the, it, it says it, Osi, but it's the name Hosea. So Hosea chapter 1 verse 10, let's read that. Well, we read that. I don't know what place other than Jerusalem. But in, it was said to them, you're not my people. It will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. Now, Romans chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. Let's read that. Even us whom he has called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. 
as he said, also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said to them, Lo, Ami, there they shall be called the children of the living God. And thus Paul was trying to get the people who were of Jewish distract, uh, extraction, who objected to non-Jews being brought into the church. He was trying to get them to see that it was God's plan. And just as he could take Jews who were born children of God and drive them out into the Gentile world, he could take Gentiles and bring them back into relationship with himself. And unless you and I are Jewish, that's us. See? Every once in a while you meet somebody who is, can trace their ancestry back through the Jews and who came to this country and maybe changed their name or something and has become a Christian and just an honest, sincere, Bible-toting, God-fearing Christian. But some of them at Rome were objecting to this, still saying it's not right. We are God's people. Those people aren't God's people, never can be. And Paul was saying, no, no, no. Also of the Gentiles. And those who are not my people, Loami, will be called my people. Those who were not beloved will be called my beloved. And it, in the place where it was said, Lo, Ami, you are not my people, there they shall be called the children of the living God. And so Hosea had something rather important to tell us, to reassure us that it was God's plan all along that salvation would not just be for the Jews, but also for all the non-Jewish people who wanted to become children of the living God. So, page four. We're just going to quickly talk about some of the lessons here. First, the name Jezreel. God will punish the disobedient. There's a lesson there. We live in a world where many foolish people don't think, no, God won't really punish anybody. There's people who firmly believe, go to places where preachers get up and dare to say, oh, God loves us too much to send anybody to hell. That's not what my Bible says. It's not what your Bible says. It's not what your Spanish Bible says. It says, hell is a place prepared for the wicked. You know? Second Thessalonians 1, 7, 8. 7 through 8, let's read that. It's talking about the coming of Jesus. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. And that's, you see, that's what happened to those people back in Hosea's day. They just dug their heels in and they said, God, we're not going to do what you said. We don't care. We'll accept you. <laughs> we'll let you be our God, provided you let us worship all these idols. And God says, ain't going to be that way. You're not my people and I refuse to be your God. So God definitely punishes the disobedient. I used to ask kids at the academy, is that anything like you want to be in them when it says in flaming fire? 
taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. We're, we're on page four. You got page four? Oh, okay. Number two, the low ruhama lesson. Eternal condemnation is without mercy. When we reach the point where God has condemned us for eternity to hell, there's no mercy. In Luke chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus told about a rich man who had all the comforts of this world and a poor man named Lazarus who was a beggar. And Lazarus was laid at the door of the rich man and he had sores all over his body and dogs licked his wounds. In the passage of time, both Lazarus and the rich man died. And Lazarus must have led a good life because he was in the comfort of Abraham's bosom. But the rich man was in flames of torment. And he said, Father Abraham, send somebody, send Lazarus, just with a little water for my tongue. Show some mercy on me, for I'm in torment in these flames. You can read that account all you want. He didn't get any water for his tongue. In fact, it goes on to say, at least send somebody back to tell my brothers that they don't want to come here. And the message was, if they won't believe Christ, whom God sent, they won't believe anybody else either. And one day, they're going to find out that in hell there's no mercy. We, we don't want to go there. We don't want to contemplate going there. Third lesson, the low army lesson. God will not be the God of the disobedient. Again, there's people that just don't believe that. They believe, they say some formula or do something that just makes them saved and God accepts whatever behavior they have and when they die, they go to heaven. They talk about Somebody that was a miserable reprobate and a drunk and assaulted women and he died. Well, when he was a kid, he knew the Lord. He's gone to be with God. Not what the Bible says. Revelation 28 lists a quite a number of people who won't be in heaven because they continued in sin and died in sin and they'll be in the torments with the devil and his angel. We're going to read the back side of the sheet that we began with. If you get that out, and, and George will lead us in that. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. Beware of false prophets. Let's begin. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Know them by their fruit. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns? or figs of thistles. Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hemmed down and cast into the fire. 
Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Beware of those who falsely claim to have power from God. Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. That's the authority of Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to return back on the main lesson where we left off. Uh, if that's not clear, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Now, this, that's in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not looking anywhere. Matthew 7. Uh, number 4. The Ruhamah or the mercy on Judah. It was because of God's promise to Abraham and Jacob. That's a separate lesson. But God said he showed mercy to Judah not because of how good they were not because of how righteous their behavior was, because for most of their history, they were evil too. There were only four or five good kings. All of them were kings of Judah, but there were a lot of kings of Judah that were just as wicked as the kings of Israel. And when God spared Judah from the judgment, he said, don't you think it's because of how good you've been because you haven't been good. It's because I made a promise to Abraham and I made a promise that in his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed in the seed, Abraham's seed, Jesus Christ. But that's a separate lesson. So, Then number five, the mercy the Ruhamah, on the lost and rejected who become sons of God. Now, those people in the time of Hosea didn't have the blood of Christ yet. It hadn't been spilled yet. And when they rejected God, there wasn't anything left. And yet, in the New Testament, everything except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit can be forgiven. Paul had testified, and through his testimony against Christians, hundreds of Christians were put to death. And he bore on his conscience the conscience of a murderer. And that's why he said, Woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel. In Corinthians, it talks about all kinds of sins. Some of them terrible sins. And it says, And such were some of you in the Corinthian church. But you're washed, you're justified, you're purified in the blood of the Lord Jesus. Now that blood, if we studied that, goes all the way back in the Old Testament too, all the way back to the beginning for those that would change and follow God. First Peter 1, 
verses 2 and 3, and we'll have finished our lesson. Through sanctification of the Spirit, to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Had he not died, if had he not shed his blood for us, we could have no hope. Had he not been resurrected to life, we could have no hope. But because he did shed his blood and because he was resurrected to life, because he reigns in heaven, until the end, we can have hope. We who are from the nations can be grafted in to the tree of God and hope for eternal life. It's a beautiful promise. So Hosea had a lot of things to say that affect us in our life with God today. We never know the minds and hearts of those with us. If we can help you with your soul's salvation, we ask that you make your needs known as we stand and sing number 28. You ask me why I hope for heaven, why all my sins should be forgiven, why I think I'll see the city four square, walk through the pearly gates up there my hope is that I'll live forever neath the tree of life by the river singing glory to God at the royal throne praise the Lord one day I'm going home. The Son of God has died to set me free, endured the cross of Calvary. The blood alone can make my robes be white, baptized I rose to walk in the light. My hope is that I'll live forever neath the tree of life by the river. Singing glory to God at the royal throne. Praise the Lord, one day I'm going home. Now in his holy church I have life again. I pray to God in Jesus' name. I'll run the race he's given with its ups and downs. I'll keep the faith and win a crown. My hope is that I'll live forever neath the tree of life by the river, 
singing glory to God and His royal throne. Praise the Lord, one day I'm going home. In the front of our books is the Lord's Prayer. Let's read that together, then we'll ask George to lead us in a closing prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdoms come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, again, we thank you for this day and for us being here in your house of worship singing you songs of praise, and worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, dear Lord, for again allowing Brother Ed to be with us, to bring us, this, to bring us today's lesson and to guide us in the teaching and understanding of your word. We pray, dear Lord, that as we depart from here, that you will be with Brother Ed and his family, the members of, con of this congregation and their families, and all of your children in this world, that you will keep us under your watchful eye and under your protection, and that you will help to keep us safe, happy, and healthy. If it is your will, dear Lord, we pray that you will allow us to return here on next Lord's Day. We pray, dear Lord, that as Christians, that through our actions and deeds, we can somehow inspire others to seek you out. We pray that we will continue to grow in our spirit and our faith, and that we will strive to li always live our lives in a manner that is according to your word and pleasing in your sight. We pray and hope that when our time here on earth comes to an end, that we have gained a place by your side in your kingdom of heaven. We know that you hear our prayers, the Lord, and that if it is your will, it will be done. Thank you for the sacrifice made by your son and our savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for the remission of our sins to give us that avenue of forgiveness. This prayer we say in Jesus' name, amen. amen.